Jordan, hey, shut up. It's fine. All right. A couple of announcements. Uh, one is I have to go to Ann Arbor this afternoon, so I won't be in office hours today. Um, two is uh, Congressman Tim Wahlberg has um, internships available. Um, they are located in the Jackson, Michigan office. Um, these are summer internships in particular, um, and they're unpaid. Um, but uh, any of you that have been in politics know that it is the who you know theory of the labor market. So uh, being in a congressional office will get you some connections. Um, so I'm sure that you don't have to be there full time or anything. So anyway, if you have some interest in working in uh, Congressman Wahlberg's uh, district office, uh, send me an email and I'll connect you up with uh, his internship director. Um, and then finally, um, well, not finally, um, Praxis is going to be hosting Dr. James Harrigan Thursday, which is tomorrow at 7 p.m. in Dow B. Um, so that's a, a lecture that he's going to be doing. It's um, He's been covering knowledge and humility and political philosophy and economics, Plato, pencils, prices, and possibilities. So sort of an interesting uh, topic. So anyway, uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock in Dow B is that lecture. And then finally, um, Professor Sweeney is announcing that the accounting club is going to have an informal meet and greet. And that is Friday at uh, 2 o'clock. And lane 123, it's a, um, open to uh, all interested students and faculty. There's a Hillsdale alum that uh, works at uh, Deloitte uh, in their San Francisco office is going to be there and uh, talk to folks about what that would look like. Also, um, some of you may know that Professor Sweeney's son owns uh, Saucy Dog, and so they are providing um, pulled pork and beef brisket sandwiches, mac and cheese, chips, and bottled water. So if you're hungry on, on Friday afternoon, you can stop at the accounting meet and greet. All right. Um, I'm going to do a, a roll today. Uh, Mason. Um, Catherine Bassett is, there you are. Uh, Lauren Blunt. Uh, Taylor. Uh, Hannah, uh, Nathan Bruin, uh, Amber Butters, uh, Ambrose, uh, Nicholas Crum, uh, Jacob, uh, Reagan, Reagan Duggan, okay, uh, Andrew Gandy, uh, Matthew Grunswig, uh, Lauren Hearn. Uh, Elizabeth Hughes, uh, Emma Johnson, uh, Josiah Johnson, uh, Luke Keller, uh, John, John Lanning, uh, John McCarthy, uh, Morgan Morrison, uh, John R. Ortman, uh, Tyler, okay. Uh, Christine Siddall, uh, Tanner, uh, Sophia, yeah. uh, Noah, yeah. Andrew, uh, looks like everybody's here, Frank, and Stephen Whitney. Oh. All right. Um, last time we were talking about uh, responsibility. Uh, and uh, Hayek noted that uh, you want to be responsible for your actions because it, uh, it encourages people to act in a more efficient fashion in terms of behavior, innovation, better use of resources, and make better use of their knowledge. Uh, and if you're not responsible for your actions, the people who are will coerce you. And, of course, he's trying to maximize the amount of your acting according to your own plan uh, and minimize the total amount of coercion um, so that uh, so, so responsibility 
uh, is important because, again, if you, uh, if the government's going to take care of you if you have a flood, then the government's going to tell you here's where you can build and here's where you can't build, or the the, the uh, um, Dodd Frank Act, twenty five hundred pages, where the government regulates the banks uh, because the government is going to take care of banks if something happens. Uh, so uh, that that's that's Hayek's point. Then chapter six, we noted uh, is where he talks about equality under the law, and. Again, this is one of the foundations of liberalism. All right, equality under the law is one of those foundations of liberalism. And Hayek, or excuse me, Mises said that equality under the law is necessary because it creates uh, social cooperation. People don't aren't as uh, worried that bad things can be done to them by the government. And uh, Hayek is saying the same, the same sort of point in that he says that, we, that people acting according to their own plan, you're going to have inequality of income. Right? Which is, again, one of the other foundations of liberalism. Hayek says you're going to have inequality of income, but you need equality under the law um, in order to limit the amount of coercion. Right, so that if I have to do something that's, uh, again, one of, the, one of the things we talked about is a law should be general. I shouldn't know beforehand to whom the law is going to apply. This is after the law. After the law has happened, then we have to apply it equally to everybody. So I can't pass a law and just not enforce it on my friends and, and enforce it on the people that I don't like. Or if I'm trying to uh, get you to do something that, that you wouldn't otherwise do. If I'm trying to coerce you, if I could do equal, uh, if I could have unequal uh, uh, inequality under the law, then I could pass things that were only did bad things to you or force you to do something and didn't do it for my friends. Um, so uh, again, very um, very similar to what Mises was talking about: equality under the law, one of the foundations of liberalism; inequality of income, one of the foundations of liberalism. And Hayek pointing out in this chapter that people have different talents, talents and work habits, etc. So you're going to get inequality of income, but you need equality under the law uh, in order to limit what your, your government can do in terms of coercion. Um, chapter 7 is another of the foundations of liberalism. And that is democracy. And again, why is this a foundation uh, of liberalism? Uh, Mises said that you want to have democracy because uh, it, uh, it creates social cooperation because you don't feel like you have to have a, have a revolution in order to uh, change your government. Um, if this were Yemen, uh, what happens? In order to change the government, you have to have a revolution. And so uh, that, that, you know, that's what's going on there. Uh, and so uh, Syria, right, what's, what's going on there? You have a revolution. And that doesn't work out very well for market capitalism because you're blowing stuff up and, uh, you know, you don't, have, uh, uh, you don't have all aboard travel here uh, sending you to Syria for your spring break and making a plan of what hotels and stuff you're going to stay in. Um, because... Uh, you know, be, because you, you, you uh, have to have revolution in order to change the government. Now, um, he's, and so uh, Hayek has a couple of reasons why he should you know, choose democracy, but he wants to start out with is that democracy is a means to an end, not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Uh, Not an end in itself. That is, we don't want to seek democracy, uh, and just because because that's what you know that's what is a foundation that we want to have. Democracy is just a mechanism to make a decision. It's a mechanism about making decisions. We don't. You know, it's not okay if we pass this law uh, through democracy. Then then it's good, right? 
the idea is that you could have what, what uh, um, the Tocqueville talked about. Uh, he talked about tyranny of the majority, right? That is, democracy can just result in tyranny of the majority. That is, um, it's not, we're going to need to use democracy under certain circumstances. So it's a mechanism to, to do things. But in and of itself, we don't want democracy. Let's say, okay, the world is safe because, you know, we have these democratically elected uh, uh, governments. Again, you can point to the Arab Spring about what happened when they moved to democratically elected governments. Uh, you led to, uh, to all sorts of chaos as well. Um, he also says that it's not clear uh, that we ought to have universal suffrage. That is, there's no general principle that would, that would give us this. Like, clearly we have universal suffrage. Now, we tend to act like that's what we ought to have, that everybody ought to be able to vote on everything. Um, but recall that what, it, what Bastiat said. Bastiat said, He said, if a government doesn't engage in legalized plunder, if a government doesn't engage in legalized plunder, then it doesn't matter what the form of government is, or it matters little what the form of government is. A little matter of, uh, for example, uh, should women be able to vote? Right, which is, I mean, women couldn't vote when uh, Bastiat was writing the law in 1850. Um, and so, did it matter that women can't vote? And what Bastiat said, well, if the government's just protecting life, liberty, and property, then it doesn't matter too much who gets to vote. Um, what Hayek is saying is that. This idea of universal, that we ought to have universal suffrage, that everybody ought to be able to vote, and everybody ought to be able to vote on everything. I don't know if you've been following us, but I, one of the presidential candidates, I think it's a presidential candidate, has been suggesting that uh, we lower the voting age to 16. Um, so, you know, is, is it a, sh should everybody be able to vote? Um, and what Hayek says is that there's no general principle that says we ought to do that. So, for example, in, uh, in Michigan, we have the uh, Uniform City Income Tax Act that was passed in 1963. And under it, uh, uh, cities can levy a up to 2% income tax on residents and half, uh, half of that on non-residents. Um, so if you wanted to, if we said, well, gee, um, People uh, who don't live in the city uh, come into uh, Hillsdale and they expect that if their car gets stolen that the police are going to take care of it. They expect that if the building that they're working in starts to burn down, then the fire department will take care of it. Uh, they drive around on the roads, but they don't pay for any of it. So we might say, okay, the, we're going to take this uh, City Uniform Income Tax Act and say, uh, actually it's other than the city of Detroit, it's, it's really, it's 1% maximum and half percent on, uh, on non-residents. So we say, okay, uh, if you're going to use city services, what we're going to do is we're going to tax you at half of what we tax the, the residents. Who should get to vote on that? Uh, under the Michigan Constitution, if you're going to increase taxes, you have to have a vote of the people. So the way the law is written is that only residents of the city can vote on it. Non-residents don't get to vote. Well, it's not super clear about which way it ought to go. I might argue that all this is is a mechanism to, uh, to collect revenue from people that are using the services, so why should we have them vote on it? But somebody else might argue, well, yeah, but this is in taxa taxation without representation somehow. 
So, uh, in fact, Gil Danello was a senator for a long time from, it used to be called East Detroit, now it's called East Point. But he was always arguing to amend the City Income Tax Act to allow non-residents to vote because a bunch of his constituents worked in the city and lived in East Detroit and worked in, worked in Detroit. Uh, and their income tax was up to 3% and 1.5% on non-residents. So that was a debate, okay? But it's not clear who should be able to vote on everything. If you were to, uh, uh, you know, if the city of Hillsdale decides to charge people to, uh, you know, to go to use uh, Sandy Beach, um, then uh, should residents vote on that or should non-residents vote on that or should anybody vote on it? So Hayek's point is that this idea of universal suffrage, which we tend to believe in, there's no general principle that says that's, you know, that's the way we ought to do it. Um, here. Then he makes this important point that he says that the power of the temporary majority has to be limited by a general principle. power of the temporary majority must be limited by the general principle. And what is that general principle? This is the general principle that how we're going to govern ourselves. This is exactly what he talked about in the introduction, right? In the introduction to uh, constitutional liberty, what does he say? He says that we have to uh, determine what those general principles are by which we're going to govern ourselves. And we have to restate those for future generations. That we, and he says it's been a long time since we've you know, looked at this. But what he's saying here is that the same thing, that this general principle needs to limit what the temporary majority can do. And of course, when we get to chapter 12, he's going to talk about what, how are we going to do that. We're going to, have, we're going to write this down in the Constitution. It's going to say, here's, what the, here's how we're going to limit your temporary majority. So, for example, um, if you had a temporary majority in uh, Congress uh, to say, um, to, to uh, we'll, we'll enact some statute that says you can't practice this particular religion, okay? And you got a majority, you got 218 votes in the House and you got 60 in the Senate to, through the filibuster and you've got the president willing to sign it. So that temporary majority says, we want to enact such a piece of legislation, you can't do it, right? Because the temporary majority is bound by the Constitution, which says Congress shall enact no law regarding the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, okay? So what is, so we've got this limitation on what the temporary majority can do. And Hayek says this is very important because what are we trying to do? We're giving a monopoly of coercion over to our government. And then the question is, how do we make it so our government then doesn't coerce us? One of the things we talked about was the laws ought to be general, right? That we shouldn't know beforehand to whom the law is going to apply. Um, and what he's saying here is it's important that this temporary majority might lim be, be uh, limited by some general principles that we ought to, that we are, are write down. Um, then he says a group becomes a society not by giving themselves law, but by, by obeying a common code of conduct. So what forms a society? A society is when you have, you agree on a common code of conduct. And we've talked about this a little bit before, right? I don't go into the I don't go into the gym and or the swimming pool, uh, and there's some sign that says "Don't urinate in the pool," right? It's a violation to urinate in the pool. Why not? Because we have a common code of conduct that you don't urinate in the pool. So you'll note that you don't have to have as many laws if we already agree to do stuff, because what do you have a law to do? It's either to make you do something that you wouldn't otherwise do or to keep you from doing something that you would otherwise do, 
Um, and so if we just agree amongst ourselves that we're not going to urinate in the pool, then we don't need a law that says you don't urinate in the pool. Um, and so what that creates uh, a bit of a conundrum when you're talking about your, uh, immigration, that is when people come into your society, do they then uh, uh, tend to agree with this common code of conduct or do they learn what the common code of conduct would be about? Um, it may be that they, that they don't, uh, in which case then you're going to have to have more laws than you did before. Uh, so anyway, Hayek's point here is that um, we ought to have a, uh, we, we ought to have some general idea about how we're going to conduct, our, uh, conduct ourselves. Um, so then he says that when should we use democracy? And again, if you look at the old exams, I'll oftentimes ask that question. So when to use democracy? And it's when only one outcome can prevail. And he adds, um, and would otherwise uh, prevail by force. But let's think about that for a minute. We didn't have to have a... Um, Almost everybody, there's a couple that have the same shirt, but almost everybody in here has a different shirt, okay? So we don't need to decide what we're gonna, what kind of shirt we're gonna wear today, right? Because markets will produce, if you are willing to pay the opportunity cost of the resources to make something, the market's probably gonna make it, okay? But suppose we had a uniform, if it's a uniform, then everybody's got to wear the same shirt, right? So only one outcome can prevail. That's when you use democracy. You don't need to use democracy for most things. Democracy is only going to be used in a limited set of circumstances, and that's when one outcome can prevail. So if we're going to have a uniform or, you know, we can either, we can either invade Iraq or not invade Iraq, okay? You know, you can't, you can't have part of it and have Iraq be invaded by some people and not by others, et cetera, right? Only one outcome can prevail. So how do we accomplish that sort of stuff? That's when you use democracy. How are you going to conduct military operations, okay? You have a democracy to decide, here's how much we're going to spend on defense, and here's how we're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to have different branches of, of uh, the, uh, the armed forces, et cetera. So um, again, for most things, we don't need to have democracy. If you, you know, listen to people running for Congress or running for president, uh, a number of the people running for president act like democracy is not about that, right? Democracy is about telling you here's what you have to do. Um, there's lots of different ways that you could do it. You could, you could buy different kinds of cars, but if you get the Green New Deal, you're all going to buy electric cars, right? Because we're going to tell you everybody has to have electric cars. Well, that isn't what Hayek would be thinking was uh, going to limit the power of the temporary majority, right? That is, uh, here's something where uh, we certainly could have different kinds of cars, uh, but the government's going to impose upon us more than one outcome can prevail, but we're going to impose, uh, impose an outcome on us. Um, so, why have democracy, right? Why democracy rather than an autocracy or an oligarchy? And you'll notice on the old exams, I'll oftentimes ask that question. That is, you know, why does, why does Hayek uh, believe that democracy is the best form of government? Again, Mises says it's the best form of government um, because it uh, creates this social cooperation. We don't, we don't worry that uh, we're going to have to uh, engage in violence in order to, uh, in order to change our government, um, that we believe we have the consent of the governed, uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll get along better. What Hayek says is two things. One, he says it's more likely than any other form of government. to result in 
liberty, right? More likely than any other form of government to uh, result in the ability of ourselves uh, being able to act according to our own plan. Um, now, he doesn't say it's the only way to do it. Remember that uh, Mises said that you can't have political liberty without economic liberty. But he didn't say you can't have economic liberty without political liberty. Now, they tend to go along with one another, but they don't have to. And we've you know, used the example over and over again about Hong Kong and Singapore, where they have lots of economic liberty, but very little political liberty. They don't have democracy. So what Hayek is arguing sort of along these same lines, that democracy is more likely to result in individual liberty, um, that because if you have an authoritarian government, the, the authoritarian will start to think that they know more about what you ought to be doing than you do. Uh, and so authoritarian governments tend to start to interfere in your everyday uh, activity, your ability to act according to your own plan. But it's not the only way to do it. Uh, and so, the, the, you know, he just says that it's more likely than any other form of government uh, to result in, uh, in individual liberty. Um, notice that he doesn't equate democracy with liberty. If we look at what happened in the, uh, the uh, uh, Arab Spring, there was a tendency to believe that democracy and liberty were the same thing. Um, but it, of course, it didn't turn out to be that way. Uh, mm -hmm. It turned out that when democracy started happening in the Middle East, uh, that things uh, broke down, right? You got all sorts of things happening in the Middle East uh, because you had tyranny of the majority coming out. You didn't have a democracy. It's really the limit. If you're going to have democracy, it's the limitation of your democracy that's important. If you just have democracy, you're not going to lead to uh, individual liberty because democracy is going to, you know, that, that uh, temporary majority, power of it's got to be, uh, got to be limited. Um, and then the, another important thing is that the process of forming an opinion the process of forming an opinion will advance the state of knowledge. That is, if this were a feudal system, we don't need to debate whether this way of doing it's better than that way of doing it. Because the Lord or the king is just going to tell us this is the way we're going to do it, right? But if we're going to have a democracy, if we're going to vote on whether to do this or not, then we're going to discuss with one another whether we ought to do it or not, right? Should we have a minimum wage or not have a minimum wage? Should we increase the minimum wage or not increase the minimum wage? Well, when you go to discuss that, what do I need? If I'm going to do it at the federal level, I need 218 votes. Uh, in 60 in the Senate, and then if I do it in the state of Michigan, I need 20 votes in the Senate, and I need 56 in the House in order to increase the minimum wage. If we're going uh, to, what, what will happen is if we do it democratically, rather than if the, if the governor or the president could just unilaterally increase the minimum wage, if the president could do it, we don't need to discuss it. He's just going to do it, or she's just going to do it, Okay. But if we're going to vote on it, if we're going to use democracy, then people are going to try to persuade one another of their, of their opinion. Um, so why do we, you know, why do we note that you guys are rationally ignorant about stuff, um, and yet we're telling you here that debate over the issue is going to advance the state of knowledge? It's because even if you're rationally ignorant, um, not everybody's rationally ignorant. So, for example, uh, you guys probably aren't aware of the sugar quota, uh, whether it got passed, renewed or in the farm bill or did not get renewed or whatever. Um, because the marginal cost of your learning about 
the sugar quota is greater than the marginal benefit to you of knowing about it. But if you're post-serial, then the marginal benefit to you of knowing about the sugar quota is greater than the marginal cost. So the lobbyists for Archer Daniels Midland will be arguing that because they make, uh, they make corn and corn syrup would be a substitute for sugar. Uh, and so ADM's lobbyists will be in there trying to persuade the con Congressman Wahlberg that the uh, sugar quota ought to remain. And uh, post cereal or Coca-Cola's lobbyists will be in there trying to persuade Professor, you know, Congressman Wahlberg that we ought to get rid of the sugar quota. So even though you guys are generally rationally ignorant about this stuff, somebody is it. So that if, again, if we set ourselves back to the feudal period, um, there's no need to debate over the issues. The Lord just decides here's what it's going to be. If we're going to have democracy, then we're going to then this will advance the state of knowledge, this debate uh, um, amongst each other. Um, so again, you know, when you look at the old exams, uh, if I ask you this question, this is what you're going to, this is what I'm looking for as an answer, right? That, that it's more likely than any other form of government to, to, uh, um, to lead an into, to individual liberty and the debate over the issues will uh, advance the state of knowledge. Now we might think that does democracy make sense if you can if you can't form an uh, an opinion independent of your government? You need to be able to sort of think about it for democracy to make sense, where you guys are deciding, right? You guys are deciding whether you're going to you know on whether we ought to have a minimum wage or not have a minimum wage. That it, you you have to be able to form an opinion independent of your government. If uh, the government of Venezuela controls all the media, then you're going to vote on whether you ought to keep the president of Venezuela in. Does it make sense for you to make that decision based on what the government tells you what's going on? If the only way that the only way you can get an opinion is for the government to tell you, then how is that going to make any sense for our democracy. So what do you have in your constitution, right? You have freedom of assembly, right? You have freedom of the press. You have freedom of speech. Why do we have freedom of speech? We have freedom of speech in order for you to be able to persuade people that your government is correct or not correct in whatever it's doing. If you look at any authoritarian government, they will control the press. Uh, they will control the ability to make decisions. Uh, for example, um, China has become more limited, as China in the last few years has become more authoritarian, uh, and they've had more limitations on what the press can do. Um, any, any place, that, you know, the um, uh, Venezuela is limiting what the press can do. They throw people in jail if, the pre if they're members of the press that... Uh, argue that the, what the current government is doing is leading to uh, the collapse of the economy, uh, then you get thrown in jail, right? So uh, the, it only makes sense if we have uh, an ability to form an opinion independent of our government. But now let's think for a moment, what happens if 90% of children go to government schools? Um, if 90% of you are learning what you're learning about whether Franklin Roosevelt was an effective president or not, if you're learning it from the government and the government has the uh, incentive to tell you that government action saves us from uh, the volatility of the markets, um, then you're more likely to learn that Franklin Roosevelt was one of the best presidents of all time. And I will pretty much guarantee you that if you went to public school, you learned that Franklin Roosevelt was one of the greatest presidents of all time. Okay. Now, if you've ever read Bert Folsom's book, who Bert just retired a couple of years ago from Hillsdale, he has a book called New Deal Raw Deal, um, where he outlines how the uh, the Great Depression was 
was lengthened and made worse by what Franklin Roosevelt was doing. That is, Franklin Roosevelt was a very ineffective president, uh, one of the most ineffective in terms of what happened in the economy. Um, and so uh, you, you're not going to learn that in the uh, government schools. In fact, when I was on the State Board of Education, um, we're in charge with uh, of, we're in charge of all public education in the state of Michigan, and the uh, uh, according to the Constitution. So the legislature, while I was was on the board, the legislature passed uh, a uh, statute that said we, the state board, had to set standards uh, about what people were going to learn in all these different grades, all the different uh, different topics, and and what they were going to learn. Um, and so when the legislature was testifying in front of us to tell us what they were doing, I said, well, gee, how am I supposed to know what the mother of a third grader in Menominee, Michigan wants for her kid or what the father of a, of a fifth grader in reading Michigan wants for his kid? How can I possibly know that? Right. Um, and of course, they don't like it when you say stuff like that because it's sort of obvious that I can't possibly know that. Um, but they don't want that, right? They want me to sit down and write standards about what all the kids in the state of Michigan are going to learn. Now, of course, I'm not going to write the standards. Some bureaucrat's going to write the standards, and we're going to vote on it. You know, the members of the state board are going to vote on it. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the way it goes in the sense that um, once... Uh, uh, once everybody's getting the same education, then it's probably hard to form an, an opinion independent of your government. So again, if that's the way we want to do it, that's fine. But it's just something that uh, you know we ought, we might we might want to think about in terms of how we have uh, how we've organized ourselves. Um, then Hayek says one may have profound respect for the convention of majority rule and yet have little respect for the wisdom of the majority, right? So we might want to say, okay, the best way of, of deciding when only one outcome can prevail is majority rule, right? So we're going to respect majority rule. We think that's the best, we think that's the best way to make decisions when only one outcome can prevail. But we also may think, the majority often gets it wrong. Right? The majority may often uh, uh, be ill-informed, or they may uh, they may just have the wrong answer. So if you read the Federalist Papers, that's sort of a theme in that, right? In the Federalist Papers. What, why do you have the separation of powers, right? Why do you have that the, the Senate is not elected by popular vote, but the Senate is elected by the state legislators? Um, it's because the idea was that the Congress, which was to, uh, elected by the people, it's going to want to do all sorts of stuff. And the Senate is there every six years, uh, and it's elected by the state legislators, and what are they to do? They're sort of the act like the hockey goalie, right? To keep the, keep the Congress from doing all this crazy stuff it's going to want to do. Um, if you read, uh, you know, what did Madison say? He says uh, that, that you don't have to worry too much about federalism because the states will be jealous of the federal government's powers. And because the states are the ones that elect the Senate, and you have to pass, the, you have, things have to pass the Senate, that acts a as a constraint on uh, basically what you know, might think of the matting crowd of just being able to go out and, and do whatever it wants. So um, what Hayek is saying here is that the majority can often get it wrong, and therefore what, what it has to happen is the minority has to persuade the majority. That's what... that's. Something that the, that is a a uh, actually the job of the minority is to go out and persuade the majority that they're wrong. Why is it that you have so many essay questions on your exam? 
um, the reason the essay questions are there is for you to be able to persuade uh, the uh, majority when they are getting it wrong. Um, minimum wage, for example. Uh, in the uh, uh, state of Michigan, uh, the, in the last election, there was an initiated law to increase the minimum wage. And um, clearly the majority thought that we ought to have an increase in the minimum wage um, that passed with a substantial majority. Now, the way it works in Michigan under the Michigan Constitution, it, if you have initiated law and the legislature um, uh, adopts it, then the legislature um, can amend it because it becomes a regular law. If the legislature doesn't adopt it, then it, and it becomes law, then it requires a three-fourths vote of both houses in order to amend. So there's a higher standard of amendment. So the legislature actually just adopted it and uh, then amended it. But the bottom line is there was a debate over this issue about whether the minimum wage should go up. And uh, the people that had the referendum, or, uh, or the, not the referendum, but the, the, the initiated law, the people who had that, they were irritated that the legislature adopted it and then amended it. Um, so there's a, you know, clearly there's a majority of people out there that want to increase the minimum wage. Um, what is the purpose of the minority in Hayek's perspective? The purpose of the minority is to say, well, wait a minute, unless the demand curve for labor is perfectly inelastic, it's going to cause unemployment. Okay. And if we can't people, if we can't pay people more than the value of their marginal product or else we'll go out of business, then the people who are going to lose in this thing are the people who have the least skills. And those are the people you're telling me you're trying to, to uh, uh, you know, provide benefits to. So the people that you're going to be harming in this thing are the people that you're telling me that are going to be benefiting in this thing. So the, the point here that, that Hayek's talking about is that it's the purpose of those people that are in the minority position to be able to persuade the majority uh, about you know when when the majority uh, doesn't doesn't have it uh, doesn't have it quite correct. Then he makes a uh, an important point that Mises also makes. That is, he says that majority rule is particularly liable. if not guided by a general principle, to result, uh, to result in an outcome uh, no one intended. That is, you might have started out. You, you might have started out thinking that this is what you're uh, you're going to accomplish, and then because you just did it on an ad hoc basis, you just did it just by looking at the thing, then um, you're going to end up with an outcome that we hadn't thought of before. So notice what did Mises say? Mises in liberalism, he said that. Interventionism, when he's talking about interventionism, right? He says, why does interventionism not work? Interventionism doesn't work because you get unintended consequences, right? You pass this law, you get unintended consequences, then you have further government action to respond to those unintended consequences, which lead to further unintended consequences. And so you end up with central planning in the end, right? So, you know, health, uh, you know, look at the uh, health insurance, uh, premiums have gone up substantially uh, since we passed the, the, uh, uh, the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, right? Um, so, uh, what, but the idea wasn't that we want to pass the Affordable Care Act in order to drive insurance premiums up. That's not what they said. 
Okay? But it was an unintended consequence of that. So now what happens? Now we've got people arguing that, oh my gosh, we got to go after the insurance companies. We got to go after the pharmaceutical companies because they're raising their prices. And then what will happen is when we start interfering with the, <laughs> the insurance companies and the pharmaceuticals, that's going to cause some other unintended consequence, et cetera. So he's making the, so what Hayek is doing is making this similar point here. That is, if you just, he says, majority rule is particularly liable to cause outcomes that people wouldn't have thought was going to happen to start with. So, for example, I'll just give you an example, and we'll talk more about this on uh, Friday. But um, when I was on the Senate policy staff, uh, I was uh, in charge of the Senate Finance Committee, but there was another friend of mine that was in charge of Commerce Committee. And he was going to be gone. Uh, it was over Christmas vacation or something. So I was supposed to watch the bill when it comes out on the floor. If so anybody's got an amendment they want to offer, I may help them write the amendment, et cetera. Blah, blah, blah. So I look at this bill, and what this bill does is it, uh, it basically sets out all this legislation about what the agreement between the automobile dealers and the automobile manufacturers are going to have. So Gil Haley was the lobbyist for the Automobile Dealers Association, and Carubin Associates represented them. I was the multi-client representative. Um, and of course, they wanted all sorts of things in there to make it so that, because they couldn't agree, get an agreement with the manufacturers, they wanted us to write into law what they wanted. So for example, they didn't want a, a manufacturer to open up another dealership within so many miles of your dealership. Okay? So that was in there. Uh, they wanted to be able to, if their cars didn't sell, be able to turn them back into the manufacturer. There's all sorts of stuff in there. So I look at this thing and I go, well, wait a minute. We're, we're setting up a principle that says the government's going to write, uh, the government's actually going to write the contracts between manufacturers and dealerships. We, you know, we don't want to do this. So I go to John Engler, who was the majority leader at the time, and I said, John, you know, this is what this bill's doing. And he said, well, should have told me that before because we already cut a deal with the people in the, you know, the, the Democrats in the House uh, to do this uh, in order to get something else. And so we ended up doing it. We ended up passing it. It was not two weeks later, I'm sitting with Senator Posthumus in his office. And who are we talking to? We're talking to the farm implement dealers. And the farm implement dealers are saying, mm, hey, you just did this for the auto dealers. Why aren't you doing it for the farm implement dealers? And of course, we couldn't say because they have a better lobbyist because they have the same lobbyist, Carubin Associates representing. They had read Hayek. They knew that if they could get the thing with the auto dealers, they'd get it with the farm implement dealers. So then after that, what happens? We did it for the boat dealers. We did it for the service station dealers. And so if you had started out in that first vote and said, gee, Senate Republicans controlled the Senate at the time, Senate Republicans... Should we set the general principle that the government ought to be writing contracts between the dealerships and the manufacturers? They would have said no. But in the end, they did. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't something that they intended to happen. It's because it wasn't bound. That first piece of legislation was not bound by this general principle that said, mm, hey, I know, Gil, I know you really want to have this. And I, I you know, Jack Schick, who's the lobbyist for Carib. So Jack, I know you really want this and it's really going to be good for the economy or whatever, but the, the, you know, the government just doesn't do that, right? We have a general principle that says the government doesn't write contracts between manufacturers and, and uh, dealerships. If that had happened, we never would have passed any of it. All right, so for Friday, we are pretty well done with Chapter 7. Chapter 8, it's just going to be one of those chapters where you read it. We're not going to lecture much on it. Chapter 9 is an important chapter, so it will take a bit of uh, uh, time on Chapter 9, so make sure you get into Chapter 9 for Friday.